Hello, festive greetings and welcome to The Guardian Film Show's rundown of the very best movies of 2013. Here, amid the seasonal splendour of The Office Studio, I'm joined by the critics Peter Bradshaw and Catherine Shord. We're making a list, we're checking it twice, and this, at least to us, is how cinema looked in the past 12 months. So there it was, that was the abridged producer's cut and yes 2013 had its usual share of duds and flops and outright atrocities but here as ever we like to accentuate the positive, the top three from each of us. So Peter let's start with you with a drum roll, what was your third best film? I would say that would be Gravity uh, directed by Alfonso Cuaron. Uh, Sandra Bullock plays a civilian scientist who after some training has been allowed up into space to fix a new scanning device to the Hubble telescope and George Clooney plays a veteran spaceman and astronaut who supervises her as part of a team and then suddenly disaster strikes and a terrifying situation unfolds. It's an incredibly tense film. Is that what kind of grabbed you? Yes, uh, it's very tense. It's an amazing spectacle. Visually, it mm. really is incredibly immersive and exciting. The idea of being up in space should be the most boring, cliched thing in the world. But I think partly because this isn't a sci-fi thing set in some imagined future. It's supposed to be happening now. It's a thriller set in space rather than a sci-fi. Mm. It made me kind of rethink the idea of what it's like being up in space in the most uh, remarkable way. Uh, and it really was very, very good. I've seen it twice. And it took, in a way, it took a, another viewing even to kind of get to grips with how visually amazing it was. Look, we need to get the hell out of here. Some help there, man. No, don't wait for us. Man down. Man down. Alfonso Cuaron's Gravity there, Peter's third best film of 2013. Catherine, what's your number three? Um, I've gone for Behind the Candelabra, which is Steven Soderbergh's Liberace biopic, uh, which was at Cannes last year, or this year rather, uh, and it stars Michael Douglas as the man himself and Matt Damon as his uh, long-term boyfriend. Um, and a brocaded uh, chauffeur. That's right, and plastic surgeried up mini-me or big me or whatever, <laughs> pig me. Yeah, he wants to be made up as, Liberace wants to make him up as Liberace and the Matt Damon character says, well, I guess I should be flattered. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's one of the interesting things about it is about the sort of blur between uh, love in terms of romantic love or even paternal love, friendship, protection, all that. You know, these people exist in a, in a crazy world that's like Mars. You know, Michael Douglas is like, um, uh, in one review, he was compared to a Martian emperor gliding mm. through. And I thought that was brilliant. And, and, um, uh, but in fact, it really ch chimes with you about lots of truths about love, about the selfishness of love, about, you know, there's a huge monologue he has about why do I love you? It's because you um, you forgive the faults in me, you accept the ridiculousness in me. And that is sort of interesting about love and really good. And it's also very funny, very well performed. I, I really love it. Ladies and gentlemen, the star of the show, Lerachi. Wow. Thank you very, very much. This is my friend, Scott Thorson. You are incredible. I love to give people a good time. Alone at last. Sam, I wish I knew what your third best film no, of the year was. Is, you're on fire tonight, <laughs> aren't you? Um, my third best film is I Wish by Hirokazu Koreeda, the Japanese filmmaker. And, and Rather embarrassingly, I, I probably spent way too much time on this list and I was kind of agonising doing all this kind of horse trading. And I was half tempted to put Django Unchained in there because I loved Django Unchained and I thought it was so sort of 
brave and audacious and, and completely worked. And yet I think I wish just kind of edged it, and maybe that just shows I'm getting old and soft in that I found You've really this... had your cake and eaten it there, because yeah. you've had a three and a half. You can do that. not really no, fair. You can do that. You can have the kind of the joint thing. You didn't tell us that before. Well, yeah. that's, you know, should have read the small <laughs> now thing. Now you know. <laughs> hey, sorry, why do you like it? Why do I like it? I liked it because I suppose I'm getting old and soft, and I found it uh, in, intensely kind of moving. It's a tale of kind of everyday miracles, and it's the tale of two brothers who are split when their parents divorce. One goes to live with the mum in one city, one goes to live with the dad in the other. Uh, and they're speaking on the phone, but they want to kind of reunite and get the family back together and, and have the life that they had before. And they hear this urban legend about two bullet trains. And there's this point where two bullet trains kind of cross paths. And the psychic supernatural energy created by these two trains passing supposedly means that you can, you can shout a wish and your dreams will come true. And they kind of bunk off school trudge down to the railroads and kind of yell a wish. And if this was like a kind of Spielberg film, that would be the whole kind of point of it. Just does this work? And yet, I think Corriedo is more about the magic of hope than the actual magic of magic. And there's a sense that all these kind of scattered characters who kind of come along are all on this kind of journey, their own individual journeys. And they're just united here at this one moment by their hope and their dreams of a better life. And I guess he's saying that's kind of magic enough, and that's the sort of the magic of the everyday and the everyday miracle. And it's a, it's a beautiful, warm, life-affirming film. I wish they're completing the list of The Guardian's third best films of 2013, and yes, that is official. We now move on to the number twos. Peter, what's in your silver medal position? In my silver medal position, after some reflection, uh, is Joshua Oppenheimer's really rather remarkable uh, factual film documentary, The Act of Killing, which is about the horrible mass slaughter that took place in the 1960s in Indonesia uh, after the military coup that ushered in the rule of Major Suharto. Uh, thousands or hundreds of thousands of communists, both real and alleged, were slaughtered by various uh, mobsters uh, and semi-affiliate paramilitaries. Uh, and this is an event which there has been no great reassessment in Indonesia. Oh. It's not like Bosnia or Rwanda or South Africa or anywhere else. There's been no Truth and Reconciliation Commission, nothing at all. And so Oppenheimer's film, rather remarkably, seeks to revive these memories. But what he's done is he's tracked down the murderers, the gangsters, and ask them to reenact their crimes in the style of the movies that they loved. And these guys have absolutely unselfconsciously gone along with it. Mm. You're watching it and you think, this is literally horrifying. This is like yeah. a real life Marassad. All these people are yeah. reenacting it and they don't know, or at least I don't think they know, what it is they're doing. And then in the most incredible way, you see the penny dropping with some of them. They realise, perhaps for the first time in their lives, what it was like for the people who they were torturing and beating up. So the play acting weirdly becomes a kind of catharsis. Yes, it becomes an approach to reality, a radical, vivid dive mm. into reality, which they would have never have mm. got. If he'd have, if Oppenheimer had approached it in the normal way, if he'd have approached them in the normal way, say, look, you were bad people, I'm gonna shove a, a, a microphone and a camera in your face, now what have you got to say? They would have shoved the camera aside uh, and that's how it would have, would have looked. Mm. But because he had chose this extraordinary back door into historical reality, he got right in there uh, and in the most incredible way, unlocked some secrets, not only for us, but for the principles themselves. And it's a gripping and really incredible film. It's an astonishing film, isn't it? It was almost my number three, Catherine. How about that? No. Oh, almost. <laughs> it was your four oh, and a half. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, no, yeah, it was almost my number one because, it, I mean, it's so, it's so incredible, isn't it? And it shows you that you don't... You have this sort of... You have this kind of apparent gimmick of him encouraging the play act, mm. and it's sort of a narrative gimmick. But, in fact, what is... It sort of stands alone apart from that. What makes your jaw drop the moment you start watching it is what they're coming out with, just what they're saying. It is the most staggering film you can ever see, just people talking. Mm. And, and it's, I mean, it's unlike any other film yeah. I think I've ever seen. And it's actually incredibly exciting, sort of, um, internally at The Guardian, because I think, to some, you know, more than ever, I feel like this is a film in which we played a small part 
in its journey. I well, in the musical sequence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, um, but in the... Because uh, we saw it at Toronto a um, year and a half ago, two years ago, more than... No, anyway, a little while ago. And um, and it was so exciting seeing it mm. for the first time and, and realising... Yeah, I remember reading your five-star review from Toronto. That's and thinking, I, I, I want to see that. And, now, and, you know, he might just get the Oscar and it's just incredibly mm. exciting to sort of track a film in that way, just quite a small film at that point. And the, the sort of momentum it's built, it's... Um, it seems it seems a strange film to be excited about, and yet oh, there's it's something so it's so exciting because it's so daring in oh what it does, God, and it yeah. really just pushes it to, I mean, beyond the the logical yeah. conclusion. Jadi cara cara untuk jangan keluar darah itu inilah pakai sistem ini, ya saya peragakan boleh kan? Boleh. Boleh ya. Nah, itu dulu aja sih ini lagi. Suzanne, tell us what's your number two film. My number two film of 2013 is the Palm Door winning. Blue is the warmest colour. So I guess it's not it's not a controversial choice. Not a controversial. It? <laughs> it's a film that a lot of people liked, although a lot of people hated it as well. It had mm. a, it had, had a kind of weird backlash when yes, it came out. That it, it was indeed. It was it came billed as the lesbian love story, and then the backlash, of course, was that this is a male's take on lesbianism defined by the male gaze, which I think is kind of a little churlish and a little unfair and works against, I think, the, the abiding spirit of the film. And it's a, it's a, a love story, it's a tale. It's a coming of age story and it's a tale of first love and it's a tale of the first love that just kind of blasts through you and perhaps kind of leaves you a husk. I had conversations with a colleague Henry Barnes about the ending, which he saw as a kind of happy ending and I saw it as, as kind of a, a, a sad ending of adulthood coming but, but nothing being quite the same. Nothing's ever going to be as good again. Yeah, I mean, I think that's... The terrible message of this film is that if, if love really hits you straight away, you realise it's not first love, it's love or it's last it. love. That's it. Yeah, you and know, that is it. what you will measure everything else exactly. against. Exactly. And it's beautifully performed by Leah Sadu and Adele Exocopoulos. Yes. Um, and has a kind of grittiness to it. It's a film about class. Um, it's a film about prejudice, but, but very lightly done. And it's a film... There's one great scene where... They, they have their first proper conversation in the park and I think Adele keeps getting like a catkin caught in her hair. Mm. And it's, that seemed to kind of sum up the spirit of the film for me because it's like you're having the most important conversation that you've ever had in your life yes. but you've still got this damn catkin in your yeah. head that you're kind of pulling at. And it's a film that's, that's alive to, to all of those, the free-floating kind of stuff and the mess of life. And I, I, I found it an absolutely stunning and beautiful film. Yeah. <laughs> Ça va Et toi Je passais dans le coin et je me suis dit qu'on aurait pu aller boire un verre. Catherine, what's your second best film of the year? It is Before Midnight and it is a love story which I think, unlike Blue is the Warmest Colour, deals with love in a mature adult way, has lots of things to say about first love, about the lasting nature of love or otherwise, um, about class, about arguments, about how that all really plays out. Uh, it's the third in the Richard Linklater Before uh, trilogy and it reunites Jesse and Celine um, uh, nine years on, not reunites because they're married, they have a couple of children and they're on holiday in Greece and um, and their love is potentially souring. And I think it's absolutely wonderful. It's technically extraordinary, as extraordinary as gravity in its own way because you have these very long scenes, one take scenes, uh, about sort of six of them, I suppose, strung together. It's, uh, you know, you can't kind of believe they've pulled that off um, in the most lo-fi way imaginable. And um, I think it's incredibly moving and incredibly profound. To make, to make a third film in a trilogy about which people are so invested and the first two were so incredibly good and for it not to be disappointing, mm -hmm. for it to knock you over, um, is just an absolutely extraordinary achievement. And I can't bear to watch it again. Like I can't bear to watch the first two again because it's just so 
perfect, really. Well, it looks like it's been sort of spun from air, doesn't it? That, that, that you, if you go too close, you, it's yeah. not the magic isn't going to be there. It works entirely in, in the moment, and that's what it's, what it's designed to do. Yeah, I just think it's a really remarkable instance of a director working together with his two leads. Uh, I mean, Blue is the Warmest Colour, the, the prize was divided between the director and the two leads. I think this one, any awards, really should be divided between mm. the two leads, because Ethan Hawke and uh, Julie Delpy really have co-authored co it, in a sense, with Richard Linklater. They really have brought their own, their own sensibilities to bear on it. They have you know, got together, in a way, as kids, but have reassessed their relationship, as it were, on camera and off. Uh, and I think it's absolutely gripping. If we were meeting for the first time today on a train, would you start talking to me? Would you ask me to get off the train with you? Of course. Well, this place is so full of thousands of years of myth and tragedy, and I thought something tragic was going to happen. It's still there. It's still there. Gone. We've reached the end of the year, the top of the tree, and the very best film of 2013. Catherine, what was your number one for the year? It was Nebraska, which is the new film by Alexander Payne, which was only out here a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's one of those films that's quite a hard sell. I only saw it about a month ago, and um, it looks really bleak and really depressing. And it's actually incredibly funny and incredibly joyful, incredibly moving. And I can't stop thinking about it even a month on. Um, I think I particularly like it because uh, one of the sort of messages, I know you're not allowed with Alex Payne to say anything about, you know, an agenda, but one of the things seems to me to be that um, when somebody is losing their mind, the kindest thing to do is to go with them and to inhabit that reality with them, however insane it is. And I think that's a very important and compassionate and gently done thing in this film. So this is Bruce Dern as, as Woody, who's this senile old alcoholic who thinks he's won a million, but, but obviously hasn't, and he's kind of jetting across country uh, to pick up his, to redeem his ticket. He wants to, um, and um, everyone else is obviously contemptuous, but his son, who's played by Will Forty, is it Forty? Anyway, he goes along with him, uh, and the wife, June Squibb, uh, they sort of encounter some uh, relatives, and she turns up, and they sort of put her along towards this um, this nothing goal. Uh, and it's, it's just wonderful. It's great about families. It's great about um, avaricious uh, um, duplicity. It's, it's just wonderful. Most I wish of all, it was more bleak. I mean, I, I, I liked it a lot, but I thought it's awfully saccharine at the, at the centre. And that score, that soundtrack, it's got this awful kind of whimsical sort of sweet music playing under everything that, that just kept setting my teeth on edge a little bit. I didn't even clock it. Come on, let me take you home. I'm going to Lincoln. It's the last thing I do. I don't care what you people think. Listen to me, you didn't win anything. It's a complete scam, so you gotta stop this, okay? I'm running out of time. You didn't have a suitcase. I'm not staying there. Dad, I can't let you go. It's none of your business. Yes, it is, I'm your son. Well, then why don't you take me? You can't just drop everything and drive to Lincoln, Nebraska. Oh, what else you got going on? Peter, I noticed that we're um, worryingly in lockstep for our number one film we are. of the year. We are. <laughs> um, do you want to do the honours? I will do the honours. The, the number one gold medal position film for me is La Grande Bellezza uh, of uh, Paolo Sorrentino, or The Great Beauty. Uh, it's such an extraordinary film. Uh, it's a very sad film. It's about a kind of gadabout man about town who, in his 60s, finds that he is becoming progressively disenchanted with life. He's perhaps a little more disenchanted with Rome, with the high life, with the fashionable circles in which he moves, and through an extraordinary quirk of fi fate, discovers the truth about a young woman with whom he was once in love and who once, it seemed, loved him. And this causes him to reassess everything he's done in his life and to reassess the, the city that he loves. It could only be by Sorrentino, and yet it reaches back to the high art house tradition of Antonioni's La Notte and Fellini's uh, mm. the, the Good Life, the La, La, La Dolce Vita. Uh, it, it's, it's a brilliant revival of that tradition, but has made it as smart as paint. It's thrillingly new oh, yeah. and, and absolutely 
21st century Italy. I mean, it's it it's absolutely It's a film fantastic. of surfaces, but it's like necessarily a film of surfaces, yes. isn't it? It's a film of tableaus, but yes. the tableaus have their own story and it's their own kind of dynamic. It kind of revives also the spirit of the flaneur, of mm. botanising on the asphalt, of just drifting around the city and savouring like a, a, a decadent but impossibly refined uh, connoisseur these surfaces and tracing these surfaces and seeing their occult reality and what they might also allude to, uh, the nature of life, the vanities and the absurdities of our lives. And all that is present in the film, uh, along with a very sweet sense of bidding adieu to, mm. to all of this. Uh, that it's, it's a beautiful city that we the, walk through, but the, getting older and yes, older. Yes, yes, yes. This is this is the the city that must pass away, mm. like like life, like like all our earthly pleasures. It's a passing fair. Again, these are classic themes, and perhaps they're rather cliched themes. But Sorrentino, with extraordinary vibrancy and dynamism, makes them absolutely real and visceral. They are. It's such a wonderful film. <laughs> Tutto sedimentato sotto il chiacchiericcio e il rumore, il silenzio e il sentimento, l'emozione e la paura, gli sparuti in costanti sprazzi di bellezza e poi lo squallore disgraziato e l'uomo miserabile. And that's it from us. We've gone from the perils of outer space to the glamour and wonder of decadent Rome. And that's the best films of 2013, at least according to us. My thanks as ever to Peter Bradshaw and Catherine Short, and of course, thanks to you for watching. Happy Christmas. We'll see you in 2014.